God we have our Jenny back. Yeah. Yeah. I miss your music so much. <laughs> uh, do we have any announcements this morning? No announcements? All right. We're going to have our pretty as Lawson is no light to him. I'm the staff. <laughs>
We're still doing a little modified version that is not back to our norm. Uh, please bear with us. We're still being careful because of COVID. So we're keeping our uh, offering and our communion, but we're going to try to work the music back in. So uh, again, this is different from what we've done before and it's different from what we most recently done, but we're going to get through it, okay? All right. I would invite you now to hear the Old Testament reading. Uh, this morning, and we're reading from Psalm 45, verses 10 through 17. The Word of God. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments she has led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her. Led in with joy and gladness, they enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your, of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now I would ask you to share your joys and concerns for prayer. Floor is open. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. Your word tells us that if we ask anything in his name, we know that you will hear us. And if we know that you will hear us, we have the petitions we desire of you. What a comforting word that is. I want to thank you today for your everlasting love that goes beyond all of our human comprehension or understanding. You love us all right where we are today, and you love us for who we are. Our circumstances change so drastically as time passes, and life is real. Problems and difficulties are not imaginary. They're real, and we don't understand them and why things are happening the way they are. Sometimes uh, we're tempted to wonder if you know, and, and we wonder where you are. Circumstances seem to defy all human logic. They just seem, don't seem to make sense to us. How comforting it is to know that we don't have to pretend to be something we're not, or pretend to be stronger than we are. You know us anyway, so we don't have to pretend with you. You know all about our humanness and our weakness, weaknesses and wonder of wonders in spite of all of that and maybe even because of it you love us anyway we're your creation you made us and you know all about us so you know about our needs and how to help us you can do something about it all so here we are Lord confessing our needs you already know about them but we need to tell you that's what we you want us to do Please, Lord, meet each person in just the very way that we need you right now. May your love for us and our faith in you hold us steady and steadfast. You said that we could be more than conquerors through him that loved us. Thank you for hearing us. 
There are all kinds of needs among your children this morning. We ask for your touch of comfort and peace for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We ask for peace in family situations where love has been replaced by stress and negative emotions. And Father, many of us are looking forward to a time when we can return to our old normal with regard to the pandemic and social distancing, but we recognize that we need to be careful. And we also know and recognize that you have a plan and that we only need to trust you and be patient. There's nothing too hard for you. You're still on the throne. You're still in control. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. You're answering our prayers right now. And now, Lord, we want to broaden our prayers today because we're concerned about more than just ourselves here this morning. We pray for your church around the world. They're all our brothers and sisters, and we care about them. Many are meeting in difficult circumstances, not having the freedom to meet openly because of threats they live with. Please encourage and uplift them today and help them that their faith will remain strong. We pray for our president and the men and women of government and, and, and the Supreme Court and all the courts of our land. We pray for the influence of the Holy Spirit on our hearts and minds. May they all make decisions that they don't uh, that they don't even understand to be the result of your powerful influence. We pray against the negative influences in society that thrive on unrest and chaos. May your peace prevail over them, and may we seek to be one nation. Thank you for your lesson studies on Genesis that we have recently experienced. Help us to find the lesson in your word that speaks to us for our life. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I ask you to open your hymnals again, uh, this time to Hymn number 323, Wonderful Words of Life. Let's stand and sing. 323.
going to be sharing our offering that I can do. We must be in prayer. In this offering, Father, we offer but a token of the many blessings that you have given us. It is our prayer that these gifts be used to bring Christ's liberating word to the lost. And where there is pain, may they bring the healing of his love. And at this table, Father, we celebrate the presence of Christ in our midst through your Holy Spirit. And we celebrate the greatest gift that we will ever receive, our salvation. Thank you for the love and fellowship that we experience at this communion. In Jesus' name we pray. night as Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after blessing and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And later on that same evening in that upper room, Christ took also the cup. And after passing it to his friends and disciples, he said, Take and drink, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this also in remembrance of me.
May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jaw that I may have a drink, and she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jaw on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, <coughs> Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went out to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water. Give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for you camels too, until they had finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw some more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made her, had made his journey successful. And now for chapter 25. This is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from the Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, and his hand was grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to him. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of God from the book of Jesus. If we took the time this morning to ask how each of you uh, met your spouse, I bet there'd be some pretty interesting stories. Some may have met at high school or workplace or through friends or uh, some other casual acquaintance. But, but kids have a different approach. Uh, on a talk show where some 10 year olds are being interviewed uh, on that question, how do you know who you're going to marry? Here are some of their answers. First one said, you got to find somebody who likes the same stuff you do. Like, if you like sports, and then she should like that you like sports. And to keep the chips and dips coming. <laughs> the second one said, you flip a nickel. And heads mean you stay with, the, with him, and tails means you try the next one. <laughs> Now, the last one has a little bit of truth to it. No person really decides, they said, before they grow up who they're going to marry. 
God decides it way before, and you get to find out later on who you're stuck with. <laughs> now, this was obvious. Uh, an early believer in predestination. Okay. Our scripture story this morning shows us God's handiwork in choosing the perfect wife for Isaac. He will also, uh, we will also discover how the light the walk of Abraham and his son were. Uh, we will discover if Isaac learned from his father's mistakes. The focus of the story has now shifted from Abraham in the book of Genesis to Isaac. The story is told in, in Genesis 24 of Abraham's desire to be sure that his son Isaac married someone from the homeland of Ur and not a Canaanite woman. He, he called his most trusted servant, Eliza, to accomplish the task. Now, Abraham was very specific on the criteria for the task. One major point was, under no circumstance was Isaac to return to Ur to find his own bride. Eliza set out with ten camels. In the town of Nahor, he went to the community well. He had the camels kneel down by the well. It was evening time when the young women of the town would come out to the well to draw their water. So Eliza prays in Genesis 24, verses 12 to 14. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside the spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to this young woman, please let your jaw, jaw down there, I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I'll worry your camel's food. Let her be the one you have chosen for my servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And the next verse, in verse 15, before he had finished praying, I underline that, Rebecca came out with her jaw on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nabal. Now let's focus on that. Before he had finished praying, when we pray God's will into our lives, the actions begin before we can finish the prayers. You're praying God's will, not yours. The problem is uh, the, most of our prayers are not centered on God's will, but our own, our own desires. There was a, a frantic woman searching for a parking place in a driving rainstorm one day. She prayed out loud as she was driving her car through the torrents of rain. Lord, please let me find a parking place close to the door of this building. And as she approached the door, suddenly someone backed right out right in front of her. First place, right in front of the door. And she said, never mind, Lord. I got it. <laughs> you know, many times we don't give God credit for the quick responses to our prayers. But he's the one who's responsible for that. We have this promise that's found in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he, we, he will give us what we ask for. And the problem with our prayers is they are usually self-centered. For example, if we have a financial burden, well, we might pray for an unexpected check or a donation to relieve our pain. Uh, when it doesn't happen, then we question God's ability to keep his word. Perhaps our prayer should have been for wisdom to relieve our burden and wisdom not to continually allow ourselves to mount up debt and trap us in that. Often we might pray for the healing of others, but our motivation might be to relieve us of the stress of their illness. We might pray for direction in a situation, but we're really looking for a reason to do nothing while we wait. We're built that way. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for yourself. I am saying that languishing in self-pity while waiting for an answer for God does not please God. If you want proof, simply read the book of Job. And notice also, 
Elijah is not praying for himself. He's not at the well praying like maybe I would have. Oh, Lord, I have traveled so far through the dust and, and the dangers carried to these ten camels. It's been such a long journey, and oh, Lord, I'm so tired. Please don't let me return without a bride for Isaac. Abraham would be so disappointed in me, and then he's going to be disappointed in you. God, give me a sign. Which one should I choose? I won't say anything or do anything until I hear from you. But that's not the right approach. But Eliza realizes that his success shows God's kindness to his master, Abraham. How would it change our prayer lives if all our prayers were presented to reflect God's kindness on someone rather than ourselves? So back to Genesis 24, 15. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jaw on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel's son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nabal. Now, did you get this relationship? Rebekah was the daughter of Abraham's nephew. She would be Isaac's second cousin. We would kind of, you know, say that nowadays. Uh, but, you know, I know some families are pretty close, and still some of that goes on. That qualified her to be from Abraham's family. That was the point. She responded to Eliza's request just as he had prayed. So he knew immediately that she was the one chosen by God. Eliza accompanied her back to her house. There they met their father, Bethuel, and her brother, Laban. Laban played a role back plays a role back into the story later on. Eliza explained everything to her family, and upon hearing the details of his intention, the family agreed. They received some costly gifts, uh, and Eliza made plans to leave the very next morning. However, the next morning, Laban attempted to delay the departure for 10 more days. It was only after Rebecca made it clear that she was prepared to leave with Eliza, uh, that she was able to depart and return to, the, to his master. So this story so far, we can get a glimpse of the redemptive work of God. Abraham sent his servant far into the country to seek a bride for his son. God sent his Holy Spirit into the world to seek the redeemed for Jesus. Rebecca was found by the spoken word of Abraham and the obedience to respond to that spoken word by Elisha. Our relationship with God is found by the written word of God and our obedience to follow that word. But once Rebecca had heard Abraham's proposal, she responded favorably to his word given to her by his servant. She agreed to leave her father's house and return with the servant to Abraham's land. There she would become the bride of Isaac. Now, if we are to respond favorably to God's proposal, then we must agree to leave the influences of this world so that we can enter into the influences of the spiritual world. It is only then that we can begin to become the bride of Christ, which is also the church. Now, upon their arrival in Negev, uh, Rebecca was presented to Isaac. As was the custom, he took her into his mother's tent, and he married her. Now, after Abraham's death, Isaac settled near uh, Bir Lahagroy. Uh, this is the area that Hagar encountered the angel of the Lord when she ran away pregnant because of Sarah's mistreatment. You remember that story. Ishmael and his son settled in an area near the Egyptian border, and they were hostile toward Isaac. And it's interesting to note that Abraham had two sons. Ishmael had 12. So quite a big family there right at the start. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And soon it became apparent that she was barren. And it was 20 years later uh, before she would uh, ever had any success to be pregnant. It's for certain that Isaac saw the similarities between his father's journey in life and his own. He knew that he was a miracle baby, but he also knew the story of Hagar and how his 
mom and dad had got all involved in that situation. He saw the hurt and hatred in his half-brother's eyes. Uh, but he also knew about the promise passed to him through his father. He was uh, to be the seed through which a mighty nation would grow. So he did the right thing. Genesis 25, verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. Again, uh, notice that the focus on is for prayer for others. Isaac pleaded on Rebecca's behalf. His father uh, did a lot of things. He constantly asked for confirmation from God concerning the promise of his son. But nowhere do we find Abraham intervening on Sarah's behalf in prayer. Uh, and not only is his prayer answered, but it is answered in double. I began to wonder what the reason was behind the fact that these two women who are responsible for bearing the children of the promise were barren. It would seem from both accounts that the guys functioned pretty well. Uh, perhaps it's, a, it, it's in the planning and watering and increase factor. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. It does not, it, it's not important who do, does the planning or who does the watering. But what's important is that God makes the seed grow. Right. <clears throat> it's this simple. It was going to be done by God's will, by his method, and in his timing, by his power. As we have learned, Rebecca is pregnant with twins. I tell you, I, I can't imagine what it feels like to have another human being growing inside of me, much less two of them. Uh, it has to be a strange feeling, all that movement going on. But Rebecca is feeling more than just uh, a little movement. Genesis 25, 22 said, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And it had to be so severe. And, you know, she had to talk to other ladies and said, yeah, you know, that feeling of movement is normal. But she said, boy, this is moving a whole lot. There's something going on here. So she prayed to God. She had to be scared. There wasn't anybody to run to there. So she prayed to God. The word for jostled meant break, smash, oppress. There was a battle raging within her with these two sons. And God replied to her questions when she prayed. Genesis 25, 23. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Wow, that had to baffle her mind. All this going on. But she trusted the Lord. As we read this, we notice that it seems as if God delights in, in, in setting people against each other almost. He told Hagar that Ishmael would become a great nation set against his brother Isaac. Now he tells Rebekah that her two sons will be great nations set against each other. But the reality is that God has begun to separate his nation of Israel and his chosen people from the rest of the world. God knows that Satan will always desire to destroy the chosen people and will use those not chosen by God to do so. Although he takes care of Ishmael and will take care of the firstborn of Rebekah, their descendants will reject God and turn to worldly idols. Genesis 25, verses 24-26. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to him. Now, es Esau's name sounded similar to the Hebrew word red and fur. Uh, Jacob's name sounded similar to the Hebrew word for deceiver. Heel grabber sounds similar to the word deceiver. Esau got his name from his appearance, and Jacob would live to fulfill the prophetic name of deceiver. Esau would become daddy's boy, rambunctious and skillful with a bow and arrow, 
And Jacob was mama's boy. He, he was quiet and stayed around the camp, and there he learned to cook. He would use those cooking skills to deceive his older brother of the birthright that belonged to the firstborn. Now Esau would trade that honor away for a bowl of stew. Thus the statement in Genesis 25, 34. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. Now Esau showed contempt for his birthright. As I read that, my toes were stomped up by the Holy Spirit. How many times have I shown contempt toward God by changing my right to be called his child for a bowl of stew offered by the world. Do you see the comparison here? Satan uses worldly pleasures to lure us in showing contempt toward the sacrifice of Jesus by accepting his offer. Paul wrote in Romans 9.13, in the words of the scriptures, I love Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Esau was rejected by God because he showed contempt for his birthright. What a horrible day it would be to, to stand before God and hear him say, I have loved him and I have loved her, but I reject you because you have shown contempt for your birthright. You have shown contempt toward my son who died for you and gave you that birthright. You have shown contempt by accepting the bowls of pleasure offered to you by the world and in exchange for your right to be called my child. I reject you. If you've been dabbling in the bowls of pleasure offered by the world, stop and think and then repent. Claim your birthright back from Satan. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Use that power to get back on track and declare your birthright today. This morning, I need you to come to us. And this morning, we get to have a final hymn, but I'm not singing a cappella on Praise God, I know you're thankful. We're going to sing number 552, Standing on the Promises. We're going to sing all verses because we can. <laughs> Let's stand and sing all four verses, 552, Standing on the Promises. 